to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth genesis chapter 1 verse number 1 we welcome you to our study of old testament books in this series of lessons we're going to be surveying and overviewing the books of the old testament to help us gain a deeper knowledge into god and his will and his truths that we find in the old testament now someone may initially think why study the old testament do you remember Romans 15 verse 4? The Bible says the things that were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might find hope. The Old Testament tells us about God and His dealing with man and, and the early days of man and God's plan throughout the ages and there's a lot of hope that we find in there from God. And so that's why we're going to focus on for a few days the Old Testament studies. As always, we want to welcome you to our study of the Word of God. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit one of their assemblies uh, on Sunday or Wednesday at the regular meeting times. They'd be glad to have you. You'll find people there who love God, who love the truth, and who are concerned about souls. We'd like to help you as well at The Gospel of Christ. Check us out on our website, thegospelofchrist.com, or you can download our app from the Play Store or the Apple Store as well, and that's a great tool for studying the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on DVD or CD, we'd be happy to provide that to you free of charge. You can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a media request form, or you can call or contact us at the information given during this program. Today we're thinking about the very first book in the Old Testament. The beginning and the origin of everything is laid out in the book of Genesis. In fact, we might label the book of Genesis as the book of beginnings. The key word and the whole idea that it starts off with is beginning, and thus God will say in the very opening line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. It answers man's most fundamental questions. Where did we come from? How did we get here? What are we doing here? And, and all the questions that so many times people struggle with are very clearly answered in the book of Genesis. One of the key verses probably in the book of Genesis is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. God promises after sin comes in the world. God speaks to Satan. And there he promises he's going to put enmity between the man and the serpent. And man, the seed of woman, would crush the head of Satan. Of course, years later in the New Testament, we find out that seed of woman is Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21. He is the fulfillment of that promise and his death on the cross. He, through death, overcame him by the power of death. Hebrews 2, verse 14, and thus kind of putting in place God's scheme of redemption and plan of salvation all the way back in the early days of Genesis. Of course, one of the key chapters in the book of Genesis then would be chapter 3 where we learn about sin and the seeds of salvation and, and Satan himself is brought into the picture. Now, for just a few minutes, let me introduce or kind of outline basically the book of Genesis in a way that is rather memorable and easy to understand. 
chapters 1 through 11 in the book of Genesis, we would entitle the book of beginnings or the chapters of beginnings. You've got the beginning of creation. You've got the beginning of the family. You've got the beginning of sin and salvation, uh, family strife, chapter 4, the flood, chapter 6 through 9. You've got the, the Tower of Babel and all that goes on there in chapters 10 and 11, the beginning of languages. And so chapters 1 through 11, you've got the start or the origin of a lot of things there. Then chapters 12 all the way through chapter 50, we have the patriarchs. You've got four major men who are going to be addressed or their lives are going to be recounted uh, in chapters 12 through 50. Abraham, chapters 12 through 24. Isaac, chapter 25 and 26. Jacob, chapter 27, all the way through chapter 36. And then Joseph, chapters 37 through 50. And so the book of beginnings, chapter 1 through 11, and the book of the four patriarchs, chapter 12 through chapter 50. And that kind of helps us to understand a little bit where the book of Genesis is going and give us a way of considering those things. As we think about Genesis and as we think about great events that occur in the book of Genesis, there are really four that stand out in our mind from this wonderful book. The first major event is that of creation. In Genesis chapter 1, we look to our Bible, and as we open up to chapters 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God will go on in that chapter to create everything that man sees. And God says, he looked at his creation, he saw that it was good. God made everything for man and for his benefit. And on top of that, not only did God create the world, but God made man. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Genesis 2, verse 7 tells us, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God endowed that, that clay that He made man with, with His own spirit or soul, and we became a, a, a living soul, and how wonderful that is. And so, different from what so many people are taught today in science or other classes, biology classes, so many people are taught today that over millions or billions of years, man descended from lower life forms and the process of evolution or we came from apes or whatever it may be. Friend, so different from that theory is the teaching of the Bible that God supernaturally, by His power, by His omniscience and omnipotence, spoke man into existence. We are not the product of evolution or lower life forms or some cosmic explosion. Rather, God spoke and the world came into existence. And we base that view off of faith in God, the evidence of creation, and evidence based off of faith in the Word of God, as we look at the evidence of inspiration, we can see that the Bible is a book that is true, and the evidence of creation demands a designer. It didn't just happen by accident. God designed us and created us of His own will. And so, a couple of the greatest questions that man has ever asked are found in Genesis 1 and 2. How did we get here? Where did we come from? We came from God. God supernaturally created us. We are the product of God. God is our creator. We are His creation. Then that second great event that occurs is found in Genesis 3 and 4, and that is the introduction of sin into the world. Genesis chapter 2, God creates Adam and Eve, places them in that luscious garden of Eden, and there they are blessed with everything you can imagine, no care or want in the world. But then the serpent, Satan, enters into the picture in Genesis chapter 3. And Satan begins to tempt Adam and Eve. God had told them, you can eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat it. For the day you eat it, you'll surely die. And Satan 
came into that scene in Genesis chapter 3. He began to speak against God. God only told you that because He doesn't want you to be like Him. And they saw that the fruit was desirable, that it would make one wise, and, and they ate of that. Eve ate of it and gave to Adam who was there with her. And the Bible says their eyes were open. They knew they were naked. Sin entered into the world. And of course, in Genesis 4, it goes a step further with Cain and Abel. Cain murders his brother Abel over je jealousy and envy. And the sting, the weight of sin falls on their shoulders squarely. And friend, from that time forward, each of us, because of our own choices, can realize the weight and the sting of sin. There's no doubt. Romans 5 verse 12 teaches that Adam and Eve opened that door. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Through one man sin entered into the world, and death has spread to all men because all have sinned. We've all made the choice. Romans 3 verse 23, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve may have opened the door, but we've all made that choice, and we can feel the weight and the sting of sin. But you know, even in Genesis 3, at that a great monumental event where sin enters into the world, God begins to set a plan of salvation into motion, does He not? Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, the seed of woman, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, who is this seed of woman? We learn in Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21, Jesus was born of a virgin. He'll save His people from their sins. And so He's the seed of woman, as was prophesied in Genesis 3, 15. And ultimately, on the cross, Jesus made a way of salvation and destroyed Satan in that sense. Uh, Romans 16, Paul says to Christians, God will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Romans 16, verse number 26, and in 1 Peter 2, 24, we are told that Jesus, through the cross, made a way of salvation. He, through death, oh, listen to this, Hebrews 2, 14, Jesus, through death, overcame him who had the power of death and has released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. And so even in these initial chapters where we learn about the origin of sin and, and death and being separated from God, God places those pictures and glimpses of salvation in there. Third major event that we find that probably all of us are reminded of in the book of Genesis is the flood. Genesis chapters uh, 6 through 9, maybe 6 through 10, as you read some of those uh, accounts. And what we find is, after sin entered into the world, a lot of people became very, very wicked and caught up in sin. God looked down and He saw the wickedness of man was rampant, and every thought of their heart was evil, as it were. And so God cleansed the world. Now, there was a man and his family that was different though. And you know what's amazing about God? Those who follow God, those who put Him in their life and their heart, those who try to live by His will, you know, they always find grace in His sight, don't they? Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, Noah found grace or favor in the sight of the Lord. And so the world outside of Noah and his family had become wicked in every way. And God brought down a flood to cleanse that world. God told Noah he was to build an ark or a boat. That boat was made according to God's design and His plan. He was to bring His family and the, the creatures that God told Him to into that ark and the number and time that He told Him to. And, and because of that ark, when, 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 the, when the flood came upon the world, that same flood that destroyed the wicked, although they had a chance. Noah spoke to them for a good long time. They had a chance to hear God's Word. They had a chance to repent. They had opportunity to be saved as well. But that same flood that destroyed the wicked world lifted up that ark and saved Noah and his family. And Noah, being a preacher of righteousness, and his family striving to do what was right, they basically would replant, replenish 
the earth when they come off of that ark. And so God cleansed the world and God made Noah and his family uh, a way to be saved in that. Friend, as we think about Genesis 6 through 9 and practical application to that, the Bible clearly teaches there's a day coming when God will once again, not by water, but by fire, destroy the earth. 2 Peter 3 verses 1 through 12 teaches and uses the illustration of Noah. Now, unlike the days of Noah where God cleansed it in water, this time God is going to completely destroy the world by fire. But there's still a way of salvation and that is found in Jesus Christ and those who obey the gospel and become Christians and are baptized for the remission of their sins can be saved. But we need to realize God is one day going to deal with sin and sinners and I need to make sure that I'm right in His sight. Then one of the fourth major events that is so memorable from the book of Genesis uh, found in chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel. We all remember the beginning of languages there and what an interesting story uh, that is. As we take our minds back to Genesis chapter 11, once again, people after the days of Noah have become rather proud in their heart. They now think that they can build a, a building or a monument, as it were, that will reach up to the skies and show how powerful that they are. God looks down on that and God confuses them, confuses their languages. They can no longer speak one to another and thus you have the beginning of languages and people separate and go to different parts uh, of the world as we now see that the case is still unto today. And so four major events that occur in the book of Genesis are tied to that. Now there are also four major people that are going to define the rest of the message of the book of Genesis. And those four people, as we mentioned earlier, are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Four of the men that we think of as the patriarchs in the Old Testament. And the rest of the book of Genesis, chapters 12 through 50, is going to deal with the life of those four men. But not just as a, this isn't just a historical account necessarily of their lives. What we see in this picture is God work as He promised in Genesis 3.15 through the seed of woman, God working His plan of salvation to bring Christ into the world through these four men and through God working that seed promise uh, through them. For example, in Genesis chapter 12, we are introduced to Abraham. And what's unique about Abraham is, uh, Abraham was a man who faithfully and fully trusted and followed God. And I want you to see the seed promise continued through Abraham. Look in Genesis chapter 12, and I want you to notice what God says in verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now listen particularly. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. This is one of those monumental passages, blockbuster passages from the book of Genesis. God says to Abraham, you followed me, you're different, I'm separating you and your family, and through you, in your seed, all families of the earth will be blessed. And so Abraham begins to think about children. How's God going to do this? And there's a lot that goes on there with Isaac and Ishmael and Sarah and in their finite mind trying to figure out how that's going to work, but we're really not talking about in the long term, in the salvation of all mankind, we're not necessarily talking about Isaac or Ishmael or Jacob or Joseph, although God will weave that plan through them. Genesis, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, this passage is quoted, and Paul says, and to your seed, who is Christ. Christ was the ultimate, not the immediate, that would be Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and the 
plan running down through those men and David all the way through up to the time of Christ, but the fulfillment, the final ultimate fulfillment of that promise to Abraham in your seed, Paul says, and to your seed, who is Christ. When we think about studying the Old Testament as Christians, as followers of the New Testament, one of the things we've got to see as we study, whether it be Genesis or 2 Samuel or the Psalms or the book of Leviticus, one of the things we've got to see is Christ working through God's plan in the Old Testament. We saw it in Genesis 3.15, the seed of woman. There's the promise of Christ. We see it now in Genesis 12 verse 3 with Abraham, your seed, who is Christ. And so Christ is the ultimate goal and fulfillment of the Old Testament. Isn't that what Galatians 3.24 says? The Old Testament was a guide working us up to faith in Jesus Christ. And so what a wonderful picture of that we see. Now, as you will follow out the life of Abraham, in his mind, he, uh, he is working uh, toward that promise immediately. Isaac then is going to come on the scene, but Abraham was a great man of God. He trusted God. Uh, Genesis chapter 26, God says of him in verses four and five, Abraham is different. He has obeyed me fully. What a great statement about Abraham himself. God makes a great covenant or promise with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, where he's going to bless him and his seed and multiply them greatly. But friend, as you think about the lives of all of these patriarchs, let's realize none of them were perfect. We all, just like they had problems, all men today have to deal with weaknesses and things that we must overcome, and Abraham was no different. We learn in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis chapter 20 that one of Abraham's weaknesses was lying. Abraham is asked about Sarah, and he knows it's a pivotal point where he could face life or death. If he says uh, she's his wife, you know, there could be some problems there, and so he lies. And, he, and really, it's not a complete out and out total lie. Uh, Sarah was his half sister, right? And so he, he, he doesn't tell a complete lie in his own mind. He may have tried to justify it, but he does uh, begin to lie. And so we begin to see that. We see that same thing occur in Isaac as well. But part of the problem is we've got to realize uh, we all time, at times face difficulty and challenges, and we must not let those challenges find us, define us, but rather overcoming those is what we need to do. Then in the rest of the book of Genesis, we will look at three other figures, major figures being Isaac, Isaac being the son of Abraham, through whom the promise is going to come through a, he will become a, a father of many nations, as it were, and a great man. And Isaac continues that promise. Genesis 22, it's mentioned in Genesis 17, and in Genesis 22, 18, in his seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And just like with Abraham, so it is with Isaac. God is working his plan to bring Christ into the world. He's going to make a great nation out of them, but that nation is ultimately going to bring Christ into the world as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then we have the example of Jacob and Esau, and, and Jacob there in the latter part of the book of Genesis, Genesis uh, 26 following, you've got the mention of Jacob. And what we know about Jacob was, although Jacob was kind of a trickster in some ways with his brother Esau, God worked through him as well and worked to bring the plan of salvation into place also. And then we have that great man, Genesis 36, uh, chapters 37 through 50, we have Joseph. And Joseph is a great story of the providence of God. Joseph starts out small, as it were, and yet his brothers don't like him. He, he has some things that they're jealous of. His father maybe shows some uh, uh, favoritism toward him. And you watch Joseph's life. Joseph is placed in a pit and left to die by his brothers. He's pulled out of that pit and sold to a band of what the Bible refers to as Midianites. Those Midianites then take him to Egypt sell him into slavery, and lo and behold, 
Potiphar, one of the governors as it were, or one of the people just barely under Pharaoh himself, is the person who buys Joseph as a slave. He works hard. He continues to trust God. He is elevated, only second in command to Potiphar himself. Eventually, God sees a way to work through Joseph, or God works through Joseph as well. A Potiphar's wife tries to have relations with Joseph. He's put in prison, but he's taken up out of that prison, and God it restores him. And what I'm trying to get you to see is Joseph trusted God. He never gave up on God. He remained faithful to God, even through the difficult and challenging times. And it's Joseph who ultimately saved his family that tried to destroy him. And ultimately, through that, Again, Christ will come and God's plan is continuing to be put in place. Now, friend, as we think about the book of Genesis, there's a lot of wonderful scenes and stories and a lot of wonderful teachings that we find there. But don't miss the point that salvation and Christ is one of the key figures in all of this. Yes, sin entered to the world. Yes, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. They felt the sting and the separation that sin caused. But from that point forward, the God who is the God of love began to make a way of salvation. And friend, the good news is we're living in the day and age where that salvation is available. And so we ask you today to consider your own soul. Think about where you are with Almighty God. Are you a Christian? Have you obeyed the gospel? Friend, that's what God's been planning. Salvation from the beginning. If you've got sin in your life or you've not made your life right with God, friend, that's the encouragement today is Christ has come. Salvation is available. Why not partake of that? God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. John 3, 16, have you heard the message about Jesus as the Son of God? Romans 10, 17, would you be willing to repent of sin, believe in Jesus and repent of sin and turn to God? John 8, 24, Luke 13, verse 3, having repented of sin, would you acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior? Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, to have every sin washed away, to contact the blood of Jesus and salvation, would you be immersed in water? Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 teaches us that it's at the point of baptism we contact the death of Jesus that saves. And so we hope our study in the book of Genesis has encouraged each of us in God, our origin, and in ultimately the salvation we find in Jesus Christ. Study with us next time as we're going to look to the book of Exodus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.